Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on and bless him. Worthy is the Lamb of God. King of kings and Lord of lords, you are. You are the Alpha and Omega. The living word. We honor you today, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. to be praised from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same the name of the Lord is worthy to be praised this is the day that the Lord has made let us rejoice and be glad in it I don't know about you but today has been a wonderful and glorious day because we're still here. God blessed us to see another day. We're closed in our right minds. Some may be living in confusion. Some may be living in sorrow and pain. But this is still a good day because the Lord is on your side and he allowed you to be here one more day to bless him. The Bible tells us that we are to serve the Lord with all of our hearts, our souls, our minds, our strength. Everything about us need to be surrendered to his lordship and his authority. But nevertheless, when trials and tests come, we still have the victory because Jesus Christ has won the battle. It may look like you're surrounded by troubles and trials and the enemy, but God wants to remind us tonight that we are surrounded by him and therefore we have a great cloud of witnesses that's boosting us to keep moving forward in our faith and trusting in God. Hallelujah. So let's go into a word of prayer. But before we pray, I just want to just give a brief testimony that the Lord woke me up early this morning to speak to me from his word. And as I began to go into the scriptures, the Lord reminded me that we have to serve him with all of our hearts. Everything about us needs to be yielded, surrendered, and released into his hands. Doesn't matter what you're going through in this life. Through our God, we shall do valiantly. He's the one who conquers every enemy that comes against you. You have to continue to give yourself to him daily to walk by faith and not by sight. So, Father, we thank you for another blessed day that you have bestowed upon us, another opportunity to share your word. I ask tonight, God, that you speak to our hearts, 
by divine interpretation. From the Logos, a rhema word that comes from the heart of God. A word, Father God, that will bring conviction to all of our hearts. That will bring us to a place where we desire transformation of mind, body, and soul. Because without you, God, there is no reason for living. We speak healing, God, in the atmosphere. Where your people are right now, those who are battling with illnesses, rheumatoid arthritis, cancer, sicknesses, diseases. We send the anointing, God, right now to heal them. Joint pains and back pains and leg pains and foot pains, oh God, knee pains. We send the word of God that the anointing will begin to manifest and cause their bodies to respond to peace. And that those areas of their bodies being attacked will come to a place of subjection to your Lordship and receive healing. We thank you, Lord God, that you're working in our lives to will and to do according to your good pleasure. Forgive us for doubting you. Forgive us for our sinful mindset. Forgive us for, for a failing to trust you. And bring us back to the place of our first love where well, nothing else would matter, God, but serving you with a new mind and a new heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. You know, our, our lesson tonight is one that's very interesting because it's dealing with seducing spirits. Last week, we discussed the spirit of fear. And we found out that all these different characteristics of the enemy is bondage. And the bondage will lead you into a place of captivity where you have no free will to do anything you choose to do outside of God's will. But when you walk by faith and surrender to the Lord, the Lord himself will empower you and give you the strength to overcome everything the enemy throws your way and lead you into victory. So tonight we're going to go into the first Timothy chapter four. First Timothy chapter four. And we'll start at verse one. And then I'm going to go into our book tonight, the same book we've been studying since last year. The strong man, his name, what's his game? And we realize that the enemy has many different tactics and many influences and demonic activity to pull you from your faith in God, to cause you to walk in the pathway of destruction. But the Lord has been speaking through every lesson that we don't have to stay bound by the enemy, but we have free will, free rights, because Jesus Christ provided the access that we can come boldly for the throne of grace every time we need God's help in our lives, and God will answer and help you and deliver you. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressively, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So let's go into the book. Some of the attributes we're going to discuss in our lesson is going to be hypocritical lies. And then the second one is deception. The third one is attractions to and fascination with false prophets, signs, and wonders. 
Then the next one would be seared conscience. And then our final one is wandering from the truth, giving in to fascination with evil ways and objects and persons. So the Lord wants us to know tonight that when we're not walking in truth and righteousness, we're walking in a category of all these different attributes that were listed here and many others that lead you to the place of entrapment. And that entrapment will cause you to be bound up into the imprisonment of the enemy's plan. One of the stories that really stands out to me concerning seducing spirits is dealing with Samson and Delilah. How Samson was in Gaza. And while he was in Gaza, he met a woman named Delilah. And this woman was very seductive. And the word seduce means to persuade to disobedience or disloyalty, to lead astray usually by persuasion or false promises. And that's exactly what Delilah had in her mind that if I can find out where Samson's strength lieth, I can destroy him. So as we know in our story, in in Judges chapter 16, it says, verse 6, And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightiest be bound to afflict thee. So she came to him several times with an enticement to find out his weakness which is how the enemy does today. He looks for the weaknesses that we have in our lives to lure us into a place of bondage. If he can trick you to manipulate you, to control you, he's going to do just that to strip you of your power and persuade and influence you to follow after doctrines of demons. And the doctrine of demons is, is a doctrine that's contrary to the gospel truth. The enemy doesn't want you to follow after truth, but he wants you to follow after a lie. And so Delilah, as she continued several times trying to manipulate Samson to find out what his strength, in verse 17 of Judges chapter 16, it said that he told her all in his heart and said to her, there has not come a razor upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. And if I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. If you know the story of Samson, Samson was listed as the strongest man in the Bible. And he was a Nazarite. And then the law of the Nazarites was the devotion to God where they were not allowed to cut their hair because their hair represented their strength, which is the anointing that God had placed upon their lives to keep them empowered against the enemy. And many people today find themselves being led into enticement by the enemy because we don't know the word of God. We're falling after anything else outside the word of God. And, and it pull, pulls you back into a place of rebellion, stiff neck, stubbornness, idolatry. It pulls you away from the truth into a, into a spiritual prison. You have so many people in the body of Christ incarcerated spiritually. Because they fail to hold to their conviction and their servitude to the Lord so the enemy lures you back to the things that God delivered you from that seem to be the most reasonable thing to do in your life, but it leads you down a pathway to destruction. And the Lord wants us to know tonight that you have to pay attention. 
Get into the word of God. Study to show that self approved unto God. A word when they need not to be ashamed. Rightly divide the word of truth. Examine the word. Know the word. Get the word of God in you. And when you get the word of God inside of you, the word of God will guide you into all truth. John 14 and 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So you got to know the right way to go. You got to know where the life source comes from. Where your strength lieth. It's not in your ability. It's not in your efforts. But it's in the Lord. And when you know that in the Lord. That you're strong in him. And the power is might. You can conquer any temptation, trial, and test the enemy throws at you. Because God has gave us our weapons. But the problem comes in. We set our weapons on the sideline. And we try to fight a spiritual battle with a physical mindset. And every time you try to fight the enemy with flesh, which is your mindset of the flesh, it becomes an enemy of God and the enemy brings you to a place of destruction. And God wants us to wake up, church, because the works of the flesh will destroy you. Matter of fact, the works of the, of the flesh would put a damper on your anointing. It will cause your anointing to dry up just like a tree. If you don't water a tree when you first plant it, it's not going to grow properly. And that's what God wants us to know tonight, that in order to grow and learn how to defeat the seducing spirit, you got to get into the word of God and allow the word of God to speak life unto you and give you the strategies and even the know-how to, to defeat your enemy. Seducing spirit. Now, the spirit speaks expressly that in latter times, some should depart from the faith. And this was Paul warning Timothy about the gospel truth. Don't allow anyone to come along with any other doctrine or any other gospel that's outside of God's word. Because th there will be an antichrist, a seducing spirit that will cause you to follow after the doctrine of devils. These strong men are especially active in the last days of our age as evil becomes nearly irresistible. And it's something because it says evil becomes nearly irresistible. We find ourselves gravitating to the things of the flesh that we know doesn't do any good for our spiritual man. But because it's appeasing to the flesh, we, we gravitate to the things. We devour those things. We, we, we chew on those things. We marinate those things. And we build our lives around those things. And they bring us to a place where we start getting miserable. Our life source start drying up. That's why so many Christians have died prematurely because they stepped out of the will of God. If you step out of the life source, if you step out of the power source, you, you find yourself walking in your own way that seems right, but the end leads to destruction. And in that pathway, it pulls you from the gospel truth. The prime target is people who have accepted Christ as their Savior. Satan knows those who says, I'm really serious about following the Lord. I'm really serious about serving God with all my heart. I, I know what God called me to do. And so the enemy knows where you are spiritually. He knows when you're weak. He knows when you're vulnerable. He knows when to attack you. He sits back like a roaring lion waiting on the sideline for that moment where that, that, that breach is in your life where he can come in and attack you, attack your faith. So he brings doubt, fear, and unbelief in your heart. And when the enemy brings you to that place, that's when your mindset is now being contrary. It's becoming an enemy of God because now you're following after the devices of your flesh. God wants us to know tonight that we got to recognize this demonic spirit when it comes. Whatever it is that draws your attention the most, it can be television, it can be the radio, it can be the computers, it can be people. Whatever it is that draws your attention the most, you need to be aware of the tactic of the spirit that's behind the thing that's drawing you. Is that spirit leading you more to servitude and submission to the Lord, or is it pulling you from your faith and trust and dependent on God? The enemy knows where you are weak in your faith, and he knows what it is that makes you hungry for the things of the world. And what he does, he'll come to you with his tactics to get you to the mindset where he can dishearten your heart 
and destroy your faith in God when now you're walking in darkness and rebellion. We got to get back to the word of God. We got to get back to the word of God and allow the word of God to get into our hearts because we are to walk in a life that's surrendered on a daily basis. We cannot straddle the fence. We cannot walk in darkness and walk in light at the same time. We must serve the Lord with all of our hearts, our soul, our minds, and our strength. Everything about you needs to be surrendered. It doesn't matter what it is in your life that's not of God. God says, let it go. Because the enemy is using those things in your life to dry you up. And if you have no substance to survive on, then you're going according to the dictates of your flesh. And when your flesh is, is in, in control, that's when the enemy will bring you down to your demise. He knows exactly what it takes to lure you away from the truth. And that's what he'll do every single time. But God tells us in his word, in Exodus 15, verse 26, and, and it says, And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. God decreed a word that when we obey him, sometimes disobedience will bring sickness upon you. Sometimes your disobedience will bring you to a place where you begin to get weak in your faith. And any time you try to stand, you keep falling because you gave into the spirit of seduction. The enemy knows what it is that's going to lure you from walking in the straight and narrow way. But we got to get back on track. We must recognize I cannot live without the Lord. Without God on my side, I'm walking in a pathway of vulnerability. And the enemy knows if I can keep you vulnerable, I can destroy you. And that's exactly what he's trying to do in your life today is destroy you. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12, and it says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. That's a stern command from the Lord that we as his people must get to the place where we hear God speaking to us and we obey his voice. This is the scripture God gave me this morning at four in the morning. He spoke to me this particular scripture. And I went on the prayer line for my dad's church, Pilgrim Baptist Church in Gary, Indiana. They have a prayer line that's Monday through Saturday. And I've been going on there for the last uh, uh, two weeks just about. And, and God gave this word to my father to say every person ought to serve the Lord. It was confirmation to what I had just read this morning, early before I came on the prayer line, that every Christian ought to serve the Lord. We got to get to the place where nothing else matters in this world. Your job doesn't matter. Your family doesn't matter. Your, your children doesn't matter. Nothing should take the place of God in your life. We get our priorities out of order because it's supposed to be God first, then family. But we put family above God. Why? Because we got our priorities out of order. And when you recognize when God brings conviction from his word to get you back on track, some things will make you uncomfortable. But God wants you to know tonight that you got to get in the word. And when you get in the word, the word will be a guide unto your feet. The word will show you the path that God has ordained for you to walk in. And God will find satisfaction in your obedience because you heard him and you listened and you obeyed his voice. If Satan can't entice Christians with the usual sin, he uses false religion to entangle them. There are so many different cults. We talked about this last week. There are cults 
what, what people will follow after a cult because it sounds good. It doesn't stand on God's word to the full degree, but it has some truth in it, but it's twisted truth. So we follow the lie, and that lie will lead us down a pathway where eventually it kills us. For various reasons, these blood-washed believers depart from the faith and embrace religions invented by the devils. That's a shame. It's a shame how we who know the gospel truth, we who've been born again by the spirit of the living God, we choose, you hear what I said? We choose to follow the doctrine of devils because it appeases your flesh. One occasion, Paul told Timothy, he said, many are going to abandon their faith. And he said, they're going to turn to doctrines that satisfy their itching ears. Why? Because it, it makes the flesh feel good. If, if it's a word that doesn't bring conviction, I'm good with that. Because I don't need to be convicted. I'm satisfied in my wrongdoings. I'm satisfied serving God under my conditions. I'm satisfied with serving God the way I choose. Why? Because I'm following the doctrine of demons. And the doctrine of demons will lead you down a pathway. I say it again, to where it eventually destroys you. It kills you. The thieves come not only but to kill, steal, and destroy. The reason why so many Christians in these last days are abandoning their faith, it originates from fear. The fear of change. The fear of conviction. The fear of losing things. So we allow fear to get into our hearts and it seduces us to get to the place of finding everything that I choose to do and not what God wants me to do. And that's a sad state to be in where your conscience is seared with sin to where you don't hear God's voice speaking to you. You shut his voice out. You turn your heart and become stiff neck. And that stiff neck is rebellion. And rebellion is witchcraft and stubbornness is idolatry. God told Saul, King Saul, when King Saul was given a stern order from the Lord by the prophet to kill the Amalekites and, and do not bring anything back from them, but destroy everything. He kept the choice of silver and the gold. He, he kept the best cattle alive. He kept the king alive. Why? Because of seducing spirit. The enemy seduced him to walk in rebellion against God's order and it eventually cost him his life. And not just his life, but the life of his sons. And the enemy knows if I can lure you down a pathway of destruction, I can get you in trap. I said it last week. God said fear. The fear that God told me that the enemy wants to do is bring you to a place of failure. Not only failure, but an arrest. God says fear, he's a failure, evil imagination, an arrest, and then restraints. And that's what the enemy wants to do to every child of God, to turn you from falling at the heart of God and follow the things that makes you feel good. And God wants us to know today that is not the way to go. You got to hear God's voice. You got to obey his voice. You got to listen to his voice. You got to get in that word. You got to fast and pray. You got to consecrate yourself to shut things out, to get a clear voice from God speaking into your heart. And when you hear God speaking, you got to obey God. The invasion. We are seeing an invasion in the United States of foreign, offbeat, demonic religions. And even one that brazenly states that it is the church of Satan. All of these religions will eventually culminate the worldwide religion the false prophet will employ to elevate the Antichrist to his position of a world leader. Jesus told us in the last days that the Antichrist is going to come. And he told us that you need to know where you stand in him. You need to obey his commandments. You need to follow his truth and not be led astray by a lie. 
But Satan is so crafty and subtle, he uses the media, he used the churches, he used the world system to pull you from the truth to set up a position for a one world government, the world leader, the Antichrist. And when the Antichrist comes, he's going to lure you as a believer from the gospel and to follow after the lie. How exactly does Satan seduce Christians? But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. James chapter 4, I mean chapter 1, James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Sin will lure you by your own enticements to rebel against God. To turn away from the truth. This is the identical tactic Satan used on Eve in the Garden of Eden. To lure or temptation was dangled before her eyes by the serpent. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. And that the tree to be desired to make one wise. She took up the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. Isn't that amazing? That in the beginning, it's where this first tactic was initiated by Satan of a seducing spirit. Because he seduced Eve to follow in a lie. And the lie convinced her to have her husband follow her. And they both disobeyed God, which cost them their position in the Garden of Eden. Only when she allowed her lust and her fleshly desire to respond to the lure, lure her, she did sin. When temptation moves into the action state, it becomes sin. Just because you're tempted does not mean you have to give in to the temptation. The moment when sin is conceived in your mind and you don't cast down the imagination and every thought that exalts itself against God, that's when sin is activated and it becomes alive in your heart. Witnesses that opens doors. After the evil spirit have located the Christian's weaknesses of the flesh, they consecrate specifically in those areas. If the believer repents of his sin, God forgives him. But if he doesn't and he continues sinning, he opens himself to more and more of the evil spirits to dominate his mind, his body, and his soul. He has left an open door that Satan interprets as an invitation to continue his activities. If you don't recognize the spirit behind the temptation, there's a trap, a bait of Satan to lure you down destruction. The enemy uses it as an invitation to continue his activities in your life until he destroys you. Other related spirits may join the original, and Christian is bound more tightly until he finds it difficult to respond to God as he once did. That's the truth. When this one spirit seduces you, it opens the door or the gateway for other activities of the money influences to come into your life to lure you down the pathway of destruction. It can be the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, stubbornness, rebellion, witchcraft, idolatry, fornication, adultery, lying, stealing, killing, murdering, slander, backbiting, hatred, bitterness, lack of love, unforgiveness. All these things are the activities that will connect itself with the attributes of a seducing spirit in your life. And when these spirits connect with themselves, Jesus puts it this way. He says when, when a demon leaves a person's life, he goes and searches 
for another place to find home. And when he finds that there is none, he goes and gets seven other spirits. And he comes back and the state of that individual becomes worse than it was in the first place. Why? Because you left the gateway open. So the enemy comes to the place in your mindset, brings you to defeat, brings you to failure, tells you you're no good, tells you you're going to always be weak in this area. You're never going to overcome this struggle or this habit. This sin in your life is going to be with you for the rest of your life till you die. Lies from the devil. Because my Bible tells me, thanks be to God, who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. In other words, to triumph is to overpower, to overcome, to overthrow the tactics and the schemes of the enemy. So if Jesus promised us that we can overcome these things because he defeated the enemy at the cross, when he died, we died with him, guess what? Your old nature died. That sinful lifestyle, which is the sinful mindset, it died. And when it died, the Bible says when he rose again, he rose victoriously. And when he rose victoriously, he conquered and made an open spectacle of the enemy. To let us know that you are no longer held in captivity. You are no longer held a slave to sin. But now you are a slave to righteousness. Get a chance. Read Romans chapter 6. The whole chapter. Romans chapter 6. It talks about that. About you being a slave to sin or being a slave to righteousness. When you begin to get God's word inside of you. God will give you a revelation. And that revelation will open up your heart. And bring you to the place of strength. In your weaknesses to overcome. Everything the enemy brings your way. Second Samuel chapter 11 verse 1 to 4. It says, Second Samuel chapter 11 verse 1 to 4. It said, Then it happened in the spring, at the time when the kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him in all Israel. And they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbath. But David stayed at Jerusalem. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam? the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Isn't that something? The devil knows when you're at your weakest state and he knows how to set you up for failure. He'll set you up at the right time when you feel like everything is all smooth and dandy. Things are so calm and peaceful in your life. You're not praying like you used to. You're not seeking God's face. You're not thirsting for righteousness to be filled. So you in a, a vulnerable state, just like David was the king in a vulnerable state, went on the rooftop and saw a woman bathing. And when he saw this woman bathing, Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, he desired to have her. A seducing spirit got into his mind and entered into his heart until he plotted and planned until he got what he wanted, which cost him his child's life when he had a baby by this woman later on in life. The enemy knows what to do to trick you up for failure. You got to be prayed up, my brother, my sister. You got to be on guard. You got to know the tactics of the enemy. You got to stand guard and watch as well as pray because you just watch it and you're not praying. You're leaving the gateway open for a breach in your life. And when that breach, that door is open, the enemy says, now I have an opportunity. Because now they lack a daisy. They're sitting on the sideline. They're indulging in their flesh. Now it's open game. I can come in 
with my imps and my demonic forces, we can come in and find us a new home. And we can take dominion and authority over this individual. Why? Because you left the gateway open. We got to get into the word of God. When you get the word inside of you, the word will warn you of the enemy's tactics. In Exodus chapter 22, verse 16 and 17. Exodus chapter 22, verse 16 and 17. It says, if a man seduces, as we stated, seducing me to entice or to lure away from the truth. If a man seduces a virgin who is not engaged and lie with her, he must pay a dowry for her to be his wife. And if her father absolutely refuses to give her to him, he should pay money equal to the dowry for virgins. In other words, you got to pay the price for your sin. God says the same thing to us, my brother, my sister. If you think you're going to get away with your sin, sinful enticements, the things you're doing is not of God, God wants you to know tonight you're going to pay the price. My mom used to say all the time when I was growing up, she'd say, play now, pay later. You're going to play now with the harlots. You're going to play now in the devil's den. You're going to play now with your sinful enticements. God says you're going to pay in the end. Some people pay right now in their lives as they're serving God because you're paying the repercussions of the things that you have sown in your life. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. It's a natural law of reciprocation that's in the world. If you sow to sin and corruption, you're going to reap it. But if you sow to righteousness and truth, you're going to reap life eternal in Christ. So you got to get to the place when you identify what is it that's enticing me? What is it that's luring me? What is it that's attracting me? And when you recognize those things, then you have to run swiftly from evil. In Proverbs book 2, chapter 2, verse 16 and 9 through 19. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 16 through 19. It says, to deliver you from the strange woman, from the adulteress who flatters with her words, that leaves the companions of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death and her tracks lead to the dead. Even in the book of Proverbs, Solomon wrote a warning of walking in the pathway of of a strange woman or a strange spirit. Today we'll call it a spirit, a seductive spirit who flatters, who make it sounds good, make it sound pleasant to the ears, become delightful to where it entices you till you gotta have it. And when you get to that place in your mind, that's when the enemy has entrapped you and he brings you down to the place of death. The spirit explicitly says in the latter times, so I will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. We need to pay attention, church. We need to pay attention. What is it that captivates my attention the most? Here's another point, neutralization. The enemy is not concerned about you. He's concerned about your faith in God. Because he knows if I can alter your faith in God, then I can get you to turn from trusting and depending on God. He is, it says he is not possessed by a demon, and this time about Christians, but he is so harassed and oppressed by the sin and accompanied by demons activity that he neutralizes as far as any spiritual progress is concerned. I've seen Christians neutralize. And what I mean by neutralize is the enemy gets you to a place where he makes you ineffective against his tactics. He counteracts 
your conviction to serve God and he nullify your belief system and put it out of action. And the enemy knows if I can do this, I can get you to the place where you're no longer walking upright with God. Now you're walking in rebellion. And the Christians that are neutralized introduces the gateway or opens the gateway to sickness, economic problems, unsaved relatives, the spirit of fear, the spirit of heaviness, spirits of pride, many other things that gateway will allow to enter into your life until you close the gate. You got to close the door to satanic activities. You got to allow the spirit of God to come into your heart, to purge your mentality from the darkness and the negative influences of the enemy and turn your heart back to following and walking in truth and righteousness. So here's a scenario. It says, let's suppose, for instance, that you ask one of these Christians about making a donation to missions and their answer would immediately reveal the particular area where they are being dominated by the enemy. Oh no, my finances are in terrible shape now. I would be afraid to make such a commitment. Besides, my husband is unsaved and he wouldn't like for me to do that. We had a lot of sicknesses lately, so you know how it is. Excuses. The person is probably saved and wants to go to heaven, but she is so locked in place by things that normal Christians overcome by faith in God's word that that her effectiveness for God's work has been reduced to absolute zero. So your excuses would cause God's work in your life to become ineffective to where you have no strength, you have no power to overcome the enemy. All she wants to talk about is her problems. We have many folk in the house of God today do the exact same things. They magnify their problems bigger than their God. And when you do that, that shows where your heart is. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be. So if your heart is bound by the things of the world that the enemy uses to entrap you, then it shows that your loyalty, your dependency upon God has been reduced to zero. You have no strength to overcome anything the enemy brings into your life. Here's another point. He said, let's analyze why a misneutralized Christian has those problems. Her financial lack stems from an inability to control her credit card spending. Time after time, she commits sin of the credit card or spending more than she should on things she really doesn't need. Remember, Eve saw the fruit was good for food and pleasant to the eyes. Because of sin, Miss Neutralized Christian doesn't help the mission program and souls go to hell because no missionaries were able to reach them with the gospel. I think that is a serious problem when you agree. So if you're making excuses, the reason why you can't be the evangelist God called you to be, you can't be the prophet God called you to be, you can't be the pastor God called you to be, you can't be the apostle God called you to be, you can't be the servant God called you to be, you can't be the teacher God called you to be. If you're making excuses, you're reducing your God to nothing in your life. But I want to tell you today that my God is greater than the enemy in my life. He's greater than the temptations, the trials and the tests the enemy throws my way. And he has shown me through his word over and over and over that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So we got to get to the place where we recognize the enemy's tactics. And obey God's voice. 
it's very important to get into the word and allow the word to get into your heart. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 says, But meditate on the word of God, keep it in the midst of your heart, in your mouth, don't let it depart from you. Keep it in your, he said, keep it in your heart so the word of God will make you prosperous and cause you to have good success everywhere you go. When you keep the word of God in you, you got to get in the word of God. You got to speak the word of God to yourself. You got to meditate on the word of God. You got to allow that word to marinate in your heart until you begin to believe that word. And when you believe that word, the thing you believe the most is what you're going to follow. If you're not following after God's word, then you're following after the enemy's word. There are two voices that are speaking to you. The enemy's voice and God's voice. We're going to pick this up next week. A few more points in this book to talk about concerning seducing spirits. Other scriptures we can reference to. But I want you to know that God is trying to get your attention tonight. He's trying to change your thinking and convict your heart to righteousness. That if you're walking under the influence of a seducing spirit, it be your boyfriend, your girlfriend, it be your pastor, it can be your best friend who controls you more than God. That's a seducing spirit. And God says tonight, he's breaking the shackles and the chains off your mind to set you free. If you want to be free, you got to want it. If you want it, you can have it. The liberty, the freedom that God has provided through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So let us pray, Lord God, we thank you for this word tonight. I pray that something has been said, O oh God, that would help us all have a personal conviction to examine our hearts, to see where is our allegiance is. Is it in you or is it in doctrine of demons? Are we walking in truth? Are we walking in a lie? Help us to see what you see. Hear what you hear. Speak what you says to speak against darkness and unrighteousness. And stand on your word to go when you instruct us to go to preach the gospel. To a dying world who are on their way to hell to set the captives free. I thank you, Lord God. For the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, that you forgive us for our sins, knowingly and unknowingly, and to wash us clean by the blood of the Lamb. And I thank you in Jesus' name that we have been cleansed, we have been set free, that we are able to walk by faith in truth and in righteousness from this day forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner, and that I need the Savior. And I ask you to come into my heart, Lord. Forgive me for my sin and be my Lord and Savior. I thank you, Lord God, that you have forgiven me for my sins. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit. And that with power to be a witness for you. And I thank you that you're faithful to do what you promised, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer tonight, welcome to the family of God. The whole host of heaven is rejoicing over one sinner that has given his life to the Lord. And I guarantee as you surrender to the Lord tonight, God is going to bless you. He's going to continue to speak into your heart truth to set you free, a word to transform, and to empower you to stand on the word of truth as you walk in the gospel. Allow the Holy Spirit to minister to your heart. And I know that when you do that, God is going to minister to you and show you greater truth from his word that's going to set you free. In the name of Jesus. So tonight, if you got a seed you want to sow into this ministry, I just posted the information. 
Feel free to sow a seed. So far, God has touched two people's hearts to sow into this ministry. And I tell you, every seed that's sown, it goes right back into the ministry. Because God has given me instruction to, to teach this truth to set people free by the Spirit of the living God. If you are a believer and you believe in sowing seeds, know this. You sow, you're going to reap. It harvests a blessing in return. And God promises that when you give, it will come back to you. Good measures, pressing down, shaking together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. And what God says, he's going to cause other folk to bless you because you bless the man of God in obedience. So I encourage you tonight to sow a seed and watch God cause that harvest to come into your hand. You might be believing God for a better job or a financial breakthrough. Doesn't matter the amount. It's the obedience that you sow in obedience to God's word. And God promises that he said he will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you don't have enough room to receive. And I guarantee when you walk in obedience to God's word, God loves you. I love you. And God cares about you. And so do I. So until next week, share this lesson with others that you may feel need to hear this. And stay blessed. Make this a blessed evening on purpose. Because the Lord is on your side. And greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Do anybody got any questions or comments before we go tonight? If you do, feel free to write it right now. A question or a comment. And I will do my best to answer it. God is speaking by spirit. God is speaking by spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. I even saw Apostle King on here. Uh, so, you know, uh, Javon on tonight. I, I thank God for you all. I saw CJ on tonight. I want to thank you all for tuning in, every one of you. And I pray that something has been said, as I always say, to inspire, to edify, and build you up in your faith to keep trusting in God. So, my brother and sister, you have a blessed night on purpose. And we remember, walk by faith and not by sight. May God bless you and have a good night.